Hello and welcome to Professional Skills 2 Lesson 23. This is the first of two lectures on creative problem solving. I'm Eloise from Durban. To connect this lesson to the previous one, how do you think ethics and creative problem solving are connected? There are probably many instances where you watch a law show or a police TV show and you see that the characters come up with creative resolutions to their problems, which might not be particularly ethical. The process of creative problem solving is proactive and is continually used to improve your current situations. Through these minor actions of practicing creative problem solving, you will become adept at the skill with less deliberation, which means the entire process will less, take less time and emotional energy. So in layman's terms, the more you practice creative problem solving, the better you'll get at it. It will feel automatic instead of a challenge. The chapter on creative problem solving is number 18. It's on page 304 to 319 of your textbook. So turn to page 304 now. To kick off the lesson, how creative are you? You can complete the self-assessment on page 304, or to really test the skill, write down as many creative uses of a brick which you can think of in three minutes. If you hit 40, you're extremely creative. 10, you can work on it. 20 is considered a good creative number of uses for a brick. Think outside of the box. Good luck. This is an overview of problem solving. Effective problem solvers start by defining the problem, identifying the root cause, and only after that they begin to work on solutions. And this process will be explained in detail in the coming slides. But for just a shorthand version, ask yourself, what is the problem? To narrow it down as clearly as possible, try writing a problem as if it were a headline in a newspaper. Then, what is the cause of the problem? To un really understand how to answer this question, you need to do research and analysis. There can be multiple contributing factors to a problem. After you have understood the problem fully, generate solutions. Come up with multiple approaches. And the more ideas you come up with, the better chance you have of finding a good idea. Focus on quantity over quality at first, and then once you have a lot of ideas, you can narrow them down. This is a good approach for all creative problem solving. Don't be afraid to come up with something silly. After you've come up with solutions, you need to implement them. So part of the decision making is understanding which solution is the most feasible, as well as which one will actually solve the problem uh, with the least risk and you need to have a feedback system in your implementation to check on progress and measure success. There's nothing worse than coming up with a solution feeling like you've solved it but you haven't actually implemented it and followed up in an iterative process to resolve the issue. This chapter focuses on interpersonal problem solving within an organization. So the very first step in resolving problems between people in a organization is to establish trust. It's not always easy to know when interpersonal problems arise. This happens because people avoid conflict and stay quiet about what's bothering them. But they feel uncomfortable and don't actually know why. So to try and overcome this obstacle, you, the people involved need to feel safe, understood and accepted. The problem should be approached as an opportunity for growth rather than blame and punishment. And in that way, that people will feel like they can be honest and uh, give details about what has occurred and their role in what has occurred. If the people involved trust the leader and trust the process, they're more likely to acknowledge the problem and their role in it. Step two, clarify objectives. Understanding what the goals are will help to identify the problem and solve it. Set and clarify the objectives before assessing the problem. Use the objectives as a guide for behavior and use the objectives to measure the effectiveness of your solution. Once everybody involved is trusted in the process and they understand what the goals are, what are the objectives of the resolution, then you can assess the situation. Everybody involved needs to assess whether their needs are being met by the current situation. Is the nature of the relationship 
desirable? How does the actual relationship differ from the desired relationship? If this process shows the discrepancy, then it's time to move on to the next step. Identify problems. So this is really honing in on them specifically. So reacting to relationship difficulties before understanding the sources of the problem can make things worse. It requires all parties to trust the process and be honest without fear. The focus should be on learning and growing, avoiding blame and punishment. And as stated, the people who are involved are going to be contributing to identifying the problems. It's not something that one person does. Once the problems are identified, it's time to analyze them. Thoroughly analyzing issues prevents making assumptions or treating the symptoms instead of the root cause of the problem. It could seem uh, like there is an issue with people concentrating in the office, for instance, and they can blame. You can make an assumption about, oh, it's just that these particular people need to be separated or they need a little bit more privacy and then they'll be able to concentrate. But they could be other disruptive factors which you have ignored because you've made assumptions about the cause without really analyzing the source. Another example could be if somebody resigns after a short period. It could be due to several factors, harassment, discrimination, stress, poor people management or other issues. Don't assume that if somebody has resigned just because they couldn't cut it or because they got a better offer elsewhere. If they did get a better offer elsewhere, ask yourself why they would risk moving to a new company instead of sticking it out with one that is familiar. So acting before analysis can waste time, emotional energy and set the issue back even further. If you enact a solution to a problem without actually treating the root cause of the problem, you have just shifted the goalposts. It's not actually going to make the issues go away. Defining the problem impacts how it's approached, so it needs to be done carefully. If when you define the problem, you assign blame to a particular cause, that cause will be then the focus of the solution, uh, the solution generating process. So if you are assigning blame to a particular person or a particular factor, then you are excluding other factors and then those factors will not be addressed in the solutions. Fear can hold people back from fully analyzing problems. They fear being wrong, they fear hurting the feelings of others and feel that the problem is too big to be resolved. So that goes back to trust. If you can get rid of the fear by helping people to trust you and to trust the process. Now we move on to decision making, which has to do with establishing the criteria of solutions, developing alternative solutions, and then evaluating your options before deciding which solution to implement. So to establish criteria, you create a statement of objectives. Each statement should be measurable, attainable, complementary, ethical, and mutually acceptable. So think of your SMART goals, measurable. What is the goal? Is it to improve employee turnover? How is that measured? How many uh, employees usually turn over in a set period? And can you reduce that number? Is it attainable? Is it a pie in the sky idea to make sure that not a single person leaves over a year? Yes. So you need to come up with something that is more attainable. Complementary. That means that the solution you come up with has to work with other processes and things that are in place. Uh, ethical means that you can't come up with a creative solution that voids people's contracts or um, forces them into contracts which aren't in their best interests. And it has to be mutually acceptable. All the people involved have to agree on each statement of objectives. Okay, step two, develop alternatives. So this is a generation generative process where everyone gets involved with creating alternative solutions. As many as possible, do not settle on the first few just because it's easier to move on from the step. Focus on quantity and then you can focus on quality. So that is evaluating your options. Consider all of the long-term impacts of the options. Assess the solutions against the statement of objectives, the probability of success, and the risk of negative consequences. And that will help you decide which is the best solution to implement. Implementing the chosen solution involves assigning responsibilities and setting a timeline. 
assign tasks and responsibilities in writing and verbally to each person involved. They need to know what they need to do to make the plan work, when they need to do it, and how. Schedule an endpoint and work backwards with realistic deadlines for each step to be completed. Ensure tasks that are prioritized and monitored. In this way, you'll make sure that implementation has follow through. The process isn't over when implementation begins. Successfully solving the problem requires those involved to commit to the process. They need to use empathy and respect for each other. And the leader needs to make sure that the necessary resources are available for the implementation from beginning to end. You as the leader should also have criteria for measuring the success of the chosen solution. So remember, we had a statement of objectives that were measurable. You need to monitor the results of the implementation. So have checkpoints on your timeline. Take corrective action if the plan is not yielding the expected or desired results. So as I said before, so the solution uh, solutions are iterative. So as you go back and figure out, okay, so this solution didn't work, what were the problems with it? And each iteration of the problem solving process, you are improving the solution. It's getting better and better. You, as a leader in a media organization, will have to create an environment where creativity is encouraged rather than stifled. And your employees and you need certain things to be in place for the culture of the office for creativity to be facilitated. So individuals need the ability to deal with the risk of failure. It's really difficult to be creative if you're not willing to risk uh, being wrong or having a solution not work the way you expected it to. And that's why we focus on coming up with so many different solutions. Maybe the one that you don't expect is the one that works. So your environment needs the freedom to experiment. If there are strict processes for every single thing, that will stifle creativity. I'm sure some of you have experienced particular radio stations or even magazines where every day feels the same or every issue feels the same. That is a lack of freedom to experiment because they follow a cookie cutter approach. It also requires the ability to appreciate ideas which are not fully developed. If somebody pitches something in a meeting which is creative, but it isn't, it's, it's half baked at this point, that doesn't mean that it's a bad idea, it just means it needs to be developed further. There needs to be a flexibility of policy and process in the interest of long term gains. So, right now, it might take a bit more time that you're being flexible with your process to accommodate the creative new ideas, but in the long term, it can benefit the organization. Listening to others to gain insight without being defensive or imposing your own ideas on them is a very helpful way to become more creative. Other people's input can really help polish, hone, and develop the creative idea that you came up with originally. Be open to it. Future orientation rather than dwelling on past mistakes will also facilitate creativity. If you think about the last time you tried something new and it didn't work, that's just going to make you feel less confident and safe to take chances. Rather think about what could happen in the future. You need to trust your own intuition and have your employees trust theirs as well. An enthusiastic and invigorating environment facilitates creativity. This is an activity that you might have time to do in class, which is to do with problem solving in groups. Without speaking, arrange yourselves in a line in order of your age, with the youngest at the front and the oldest in the back. Just because you are in the classroom doing an activity doesn't mean that we forget that COVID still exists and that there are new variants developing all the time. Wear masks and keep a distance between yourselves. You might do this in smaller groups as well. If you have time, you can also do this activity of creativity. Your lecturer will give you a problem to solve, and your goal is to come up with the most ridiculous solutions in the quickest time. This approach is called dumbest idea first. I didn't include the word dumbest because I find that's an insulting word. Just because uh, an idea doesn't seem particularly clever doesn't mean that it is useless. So I use the word ridiculous here. Come up with something completely bananas. Raise your hand to share the idea and once there are five to ten ideas, go over the list. 
The ideas that you first thought of as ridiculous aren't as bad as, they, as you thought, are they? Removing the fear of failure produces creative and helpful results. In future, when you are a leader in an organization, try this approach when there's a problem that comes up which your established processes can't resolve. Once you have worked through all of the material with your lecturer and done some activities, you can complete the concept quiz on page 310 and 11 of your set book. The next lecture will be a practical application of what you've learned today. So there will be no video.